Hello, and thank you for watching this Hatfield Museum and History Society Community Program presentation. I'm Larry Stevens, President of the Society, and the topic of this program is the history of the Stewart Farmstead here in Hatfield, and will be pre presented by Ralph Harvey with some comments and memories from Peg Stewart Harvey. Last year, Ralph and Peg visited the museum and were telling me about their property and I learned that it was the most complete example of an early 1900s farm here in Hatfield. In fact, still standing on the property are a corn crib and windmill. Now, it wasn't too long ago that both of these items were quite commonly seen in the Hatfield landscape, but now I believe that this is the only corn crib and windmill remaining in Hatfield. Now, if I'm wrong, I would be glad to be corrected. So I thought that a program about the farmstead would be quite interesting, and I asked Ralph and Peg if they would be interested in putting together a program, and they agreed. So at this time, I'll turn the microphone over to Ralph Harvey to present this program on the history of the Stewart farmstead. Ralph? Thank you, Larry. Uh, I'm Ralph Harvey, and my wife Peg, we own the Stewart farm. And the property has been in her family, our family, for 100 years. And what you have here now is an aerial view of the property that shows five major fields that remain of the farm and the buildings, obviously, that are on it. And it is approximately 26 to 27 acres total. And um, the major buildings are the green roofs and whatever, which we'll be showing you at that time. Now, this is begins the deed history of the Stewart Farm. So, right, in 1682, William Penn granted a tract of 5,000 acres to Thomas Harley of London. So it makes you wonder how he knew what he had because in 1680s, there was no Zillow, or there was no Google Earth, so he's probably in Philadelphia and told you got 5,000 acres 40 plus miles north of here. How do you know what it is and how do you get there? And probably the way that he did was an Indian trail that became Route 309. And that trail was the Mincy Trail, and it extended like 40-some miles north to south. By the mid-1700s, the trail became what we know of today, Bethlehem Pike. Thomas Harley then sold a track to Thomas Fairman. In 1702, then 2,500 acres went to John Morris. And as you can see, it's between County Line Road, Cowpath Road, and Unionville Pike down to Montgomery Township. This is an, an, a depiction of really what was shown there. Most of the, most of the data we have here that will be seen tonight, well, some will come from the history of Hatfield. Others will come from Dave Kimmerly, who did a research of the property to designate the property as a historic site, which was successful, and we thank him for that. Other forms that I have are tax forms and census forms, and of course, if it looks good and edited right, that's because Larry did a good job. But here's a depiction of that property of 2,500 acres. Then in 1702, and we can see it here, that John Morris gave 250 to William Bevan, and in 1735, to Abraham Free. Then the property was sold to Jacob Shooter. Now, Jacob might be the first resident of Hatfield Township because you can see the property is Treeree Town, Line Lexington, Frick's Burial Ground, and over to William Kerr's residence, which was maybe if you want to call it the center of Hatfield Township at the moment. And here's, there again, a, a plot depiction of that property and Jacob Shooter tract is outlined in yellow. Again, back to the history, we can see that 1740 to 48, Jacob Shooter gave some property to Jacob Wireman. Then in 48, Wireman conveyed 73 acres to Michael Kreider. And then Kreider, 1750, he purchased additional acreage for a total of 95. 1761, and Abraham Kreider gave it to his son by will. 
Then in 1763, Kreider sold to Jacob Klein, and Klein in 1793 sold 50 acres to John Klein. And here is a tax record showing John Klein, Hatfield Township, 1798. 1806, John Klein sold 40 acres to Christian Rohr. And here's a census at that time showing Christian Rohr. Now, prior to 1850, most records, if not all records, just showed a head of household with the other families listed as female or female and a breakup of ages. By 1850, the census form changed to provide a, a lot of additional information. In 1830, Jacob Rohr sold the property to Christian Benner. And here again, the 1830 census shows Christian Brenner and additional ages of males and females that are on the property also. And it looks like there's only two, himself and his wife, at least what's shown. 1837, Christian Brenner sold the property to his son, 31 acres. In 1837, Christian Brenner sold the property to William Rittenhouse Sr. Here's a map of 1848 that showed the property at the corner of Line and Lexington at the bends. And you can see at the top where Clymer Road is, Line Lexington Road doesn't continue to Old Beth or Bethlehem Pike or Old Bethlehem Pike. So that road didn't exist yet. Here's, a, here's the 1850 census, which provides more information of properties, owners, and their families. And you can see William Rittenhouse is 45 and 35. Then William Jr., Sarah, and Mary. He's listed as a farmer, and his value is listed at 1800. And they were all born in Pennsylvania. 1857 map, additional shows the bends in the road where the property is and lying lexington road still hasn't gone to bethlehem pike this is 1860 census william rittenhouse again with the ages of farmer and it shows the the, the children and family 1861 map of hatfield you can see the rittenhouse is on the on the property, way off the road, which it still exists today, and Line Lexington Road now continues on to Bethlehem Pike. Back to the history. After William Rittenhouse died in 1864, his son conveyed the property to Henry Robinson. And then Robinson gave it back to Rittenhouse in 64. And in 1884, Rittenhouse Jr. sold to Sarah Kaler and, his, and John Kaler. What I could find about him was the only Kaler that was in Montgomery County was, a, was a, in living in Norristown, and I'm not real sure if he moved up here or not. But in 1865, they sold to James Gamble. 1870 census shows Edward Gamble as the owner, the children, and wife as a farmer, personal value of property, $100. He was from Ireland. The wife and the, obviously the rest of the kids were from Pennsylvania. If you read some of them up above, that uh, a lot of you know, there were whether they could read or not, go to school or not, and it's just the additional information. Okay, the 1871 map shows Joseph Gamble as the owner. As, the, as you can see, the property and house sits way off the road, which it still does today. So, 1871, James Gamble sold to James McKegg. He later gave it to his son, Edward McKegg, and an 1877 map of Hatfield shows the McKeg as the owners of the property. Still way off the road as it is today. Okay, this is the 1880 census. Edward McKeg is the owner. It shows the family, and he is a farmer. 
wife is keeping house and the children are there. He's from Ireland and she's from Ireland and the kids are from Pennsylvania. Yeah, this is the 1880 agricultural census of the area and he's listed and all across the top are lists the crops that are there, animals that are there, and trees, what they grow in produce, and in probably in some of the forms is whether they have uh, any kind of machinery or whatnot. Here is the McKeg. This is the property again. And you can see its shape is not quite square, and it's sort of an odd shape that's been that way forever. And still some of that is today. All right, this is a 1900 federal census where Edward McKeg is the owner born in 1845 in Ireland. He's a single farmer living on the property, but he has a servant, Eliza, I believe it's Og, that lives with him. Now you can see that here, Edward died and his administrator sold the property. And ultimately he's buried at the Frick Cemetery and has to be so and had to have he has posts on that outline his, his cemetery plot, but this is the sale advertisement for the property. It contains 42 acres, a two-story dwelling and a barn for six cows, three horses, and other necessary outbuildings. Fruit trees are also available. And of course, this good advertisement is convenient to schools, churches, stores, and a post office. He has additional property to be sold at auction. And this is a, an appraised value of all the property, which is total of $62.35. But if you look at the individual items that are for sale, he has a carriage for 75 cents. A windmill is 50 cents. So if you give an opportunity here to, little, to read this, you'll be surprised to see the value in that era of 1907. Things are, by our standard, very cheap. I think the horse was here 75 cents or something like that. But anyway, this was, the, this was the items that were for sale at the time of the auction. In 1909, George Kratz sold to Gertrude May Zane the property. And the Zanes purchased the property for $2,300. She replaced all the buildings, which were a two-story house and building, and replaced it with all their farm buildings, which exist today. This is the 1910 census. This is the 1910 census of the property. Okay, and Henry Marion Zane was 34. Gertrude May was 34, and then they had Henry... And I think it was Olivia, They're all from Pennsylvania. And one question they asked, which is, how many children do you have and how many children are living? And they had two and two living. And the question has always been, infant mortality rate was an issue in that era. So you might have five children born, but over nearly three living. So that was a question on, this, on the form at this point in time. This is a foot footprint of the property as it is today. There are 10 buildings on it which still exist. And up here on the left corner of the, of the property, we have the wood building, which was for the heater, I would assume. Then we have the what we call, it's listed here as a shed, we call it the pump house because the well is here. Then this is the house. This is the house here in the porch. Then we have a chicken coop, the only one that remains, which we'll see pictures of all these. Corn crib, two-story garage, milk house, windmill, barn, machine shed, and outhouse. These were originally built in 1909, and they still exist today. This is a depiction of the entrance to the property. And you can see the outhouse on the left, the machine shed behind it, the barn, 
to the right of that. The garage is to the right of that. And the little bit you can see of the milk house is to the right and the far right. Now, in that era, prior to this, like 1800s, the house was always built adjacent to the barn. But when they started in the 1900s, they didn't want to have the house near to the barn because of the odors and whatnot. So the house was planned to be away from the barn and always a good view in the house was placed to have to show the good view. And as a sanitary issue to make it look good, where the cows were and were painted white, the milk house interior was painted white. This was what a standard barn looked like and was advertised in that era. And never showed an overhang in the front, but it was, and it's just a standard rectangular building where this barn is different. It has an overhang with six posts. These six poles that you see here were the same poles that were on the house. And it was my thought that when the idea to make that side of the porch, the right side of the porch, the kitchen, these poles were then used to make the overhang of the barn. The roof itself was obviously wood framing, but the, it was a tin roof over some subroof material, which over years rust and corroded and pinned and we had to get tar and retar the roof every year after winter. The barn itself is 64 by 36. The doors on the far left, the green door was where the cows were and there was room for four cows. And what you can't see there, to the right of that green door, there's a double open door that drives through the building. So you could bring your hay wagon in or whatever machinery you had, and you could unload it or do whatever was necessary. And you can see to the right of that, there's a green door behind the pole. That was available to the stalls where horses or ponies or whatever could come and go. And at the far right, you see some windows. Now that is a blocked off area now, but there was a sliding door there, which was available or open to the carriage or wagon that was part of property. And it was a drive-through. And you can see that when we go to the rear part of the building in that slide picture. A lot of windows because there's no electricity. So you know, always had to try to give the available light to do that. This is the back of the building, and you can see, you can see here is a straight line, and this was the sliding door in the back of the building for the carriage to drive through. When it was boarded over, when carriages were no longer needed for farm operation, they closed it up, additional windows for light and a door. This was the door for the horses double doors to slide open, and then the far right door was for cattle, the cows. This is the footprint of the, of the barn itself, pretty much the way it is. The dairy was over here, which were for cows, painted white to show sanitation. This was the drive-through area with the double doors where you could bring in, bring in whatever, your wagons, tractor, stalls for the animals, and the drive through for the carriage house. This is the side of the barn that shows the three windows where the carriage door was, and the second floor door was to the haymow. The floor of the haymow consisted of three types of floors. Over the carriage area was a tongue and groove floor, which was tight and would let in dust and dirt fall down onto the carriage. Over the stables, it was an open board floor that probably let the hay breathe. On the other side of the, of the drive through the thrashing floor was a flat random width boards that were tight fitting so none of the hay would fall on the cows. This is the machine shed and it was 
it was a 20 by 50 foot building, which was, when it, when it was originally built, when it came down here about halfway down the building, this area we figured that it would produce, all the produce provided and picked from the farm was brought into the building in the back. There's two sliding doors on the other side. And then in the front of the building, they were sorted and gotten ready for market. There are four windows on the other side, two windows here or there again to allow light in there to do their job. There was doors here, two barn type doors, which I replaced with an overhead door where then the product was loaded onto a truck and gone to market. In 1933, the Stewarts added another 50 feet of a machine shed. And that, that allowed three additional rooms. And they were more for storage except for the back room there. That was sort of the work room. It had a one corner was for the blacksmith. Beside that was some woodworking machinery that was run by a gasoline engine, hit and miss engine, a workbench for whatever you needed to do. So it was primarily, I guess, the main area of activity for other than farming on the property. This is a two-story garage. And the garage is 22 by 40, a dirt floor. And the second floor is really, in the front of the building here, is incomplete for whatever reason. I don't have any idea. The back of the building has a tongue and groove solid floor. And we figured that's where the help stayed, the farm workers stayed, to work on the farm. Because I feel that, I don't know if Mr. Zane was a gentleman farmer coming out of Philadelphia, I really don't know. But at the bottom of the stairway, there was a sink that emptied into the dirt of the floor. And out the back was the outhouse for the employees to use, which I relocated and we'll talk about later. This is a picture of the milk house, which is 10 by 10. And inside the milk house, painted white, there was a sink, which no water supply, but I guess they got from a well, which was dug behind the building. And then there was for the milk cans to be cleaned, and I guess milk for transfer to containers or whatever. 25-foot windmill is behind it. Below that is a hand dug well. In fact, there are three total hand dug wells on the property. The house you can see behind it is where we'll go to next. This is obviously the main house. Now the house is 30 by 30 with an addition of a kitchen and a 20 by 30 porch. It's very interesting, but that, this is actually the side of the house and not the front of the house. The portico is to drive your wagon up so anybody can get in and out out of the weather. The third floor, the third floor <clears throat> had a water tank in it that provided running water to the bathroom only and not the kitchen. <clears throat> and water was pumped up there via a jack pump from the well operated by a gasoline engine. No electric in the building until after 1933. So, a lot of windows to, to provide light into the building. The small window on the second floor, center, there again, the, there was a walkway, there is a walkway between the two rooms and a closet, and that provided light into that area. Below, on the first floor where you see a door, now there was another small window that provided light to the stairway because this house had a master stairway and a back stairway. And where the door is, is where the back stairway came down to the first floor. The heating system, and you wonder how it would work since there's no electric, but I think it was steam heat. And since Mr. Zane was a builder down in Philadelphia in the beginning of the turn of the century, steam heat was coming into commercial buildings. 
<clears throat> and I think that's what came here. Because on the third floor at the end, the last radiator, radiator has a large pressure dial, which is no longer needed, but still exists on the radiator. And I think that steam heat was used to heat the building because you had no electric, you had no circulation or circulator. So to me, it was the only way to get there. Now, what you don't see here also is the second floor, the porch that hangs over the first floor. On top of that were railings that look just like the first floor railings. So you can exit the building on the second floor and use the porch on the porch roof above. So, as I say, there was no electric until 1933 or after that um, President Roosevelt New Deal provided electric to the suburban rural farm areas. And that's when I figure electric came. So, it's either gas lamps, carbide gas, which I believe the first floor had some. We have carbide, we have the gas lamps uh, in pieces on the property, but I have no way of knowing. There's no way that I could see that where that gas entered the building to be used because the generator was outside, the gas generator. And I know Melvin, her Peg's father, said that you lost the gas on the inside. You don't want to go outside with a lantern on the outside because it could be that you would get a, a surprise. So that's the side of the building. This is the front of the building. The front door, front door. This window on the second floor would slide up into the wall to let you exit the room and enter the porch, the second floor porch. And this supposedly, I guess, is where the good view was when you looked out the windows. But you can see the, the porch, the railings, and um, it's a three-story. This, this room up here is the full length of the, of the house. And there are two other rooms on the other side of the stairway. This was the back of the house. <clears throat> there again, this window here would slide up in, into the wall and let you exit onto the porch on the second floor. And if you remember, I said there were six poles on the barn down there. I think this was a porch or designed to be a porch at one time. It is now the kitchen to here. And that decision was made after the house was built but probably not moved into because the inside wall is made the same way as the outside wall material and there's a window. Now who would put a window that would look at a storage area? So it's my guess is the decision was made after the house was built and they made a change and put this in as a kitchen. On this side of the house on the third floor, this is where the water was, the water tank, and the water was pumped up. I really can't explain how that worked, but the water was pumped up because it, and it gravity down into the bathroom, which was right here. So, but it didn't feed, the water didn't feed the kitchen. Don't know why, but it didn't feed the kitchen. This is the footprint of the first floor as it is today. The house is made into apartments, an upstairs and downstairs apartment. The master staircase, which is over here, still exists, but the landing has been removed, which we still have. The front door is a bedroom, living room, and it was a dining room, and then the kitchen and the storage area, which I said, there's a window like right here. Why would you have a window into the storage area? But, and the upstairs, the upstairs is four rooms and a bathroom. The third floor is three rooms.
total. These are the two buildings in the back. This is the pump house. This is the pump house, which does have the well dug in it, and it provides water to the house. It also has a little work area and whatever if it was needed, and but it's very rarely used or open because it's good. This is the the wood building. There, I guess, was would provide a source of fuel for the steam heat heater downstairs. The pump house is 10 by 10 and the wood building is 8 by 10. Next is one of the chicken coops. There were two of these. I was able to save one and it's a 10 by 14 building. Corn crib. It's a 6 by 14 building and um, it was close to the barn. This just shows, even though there's a deer in there, this shows we call it the cow path because when you would let the cows out and go to the pasture, they would go down here and enter the lower fields. This is the back lane looking towards looking towards the chicken coop. The house is over here to the right, which you can't see. It's uh, it's always been stone, and I'd like to leave it that way. And um, it's just um, <clears throat> very narrow, but it does it's functional. This is lane, the lane looking the other way, where you got the barn in the garage. This is the back door, obviously to the garage. The employees or farm hands would live up here. Sink would have been on this corner. The outhouse was over here for them, but I moved it because of trees issues. Then the machine shed is, is all far further down. And you can see this is about where the 50 foot area ended and they added the additional 50 feet. The, this is the outhouse, which I relocated. It's 52 inches by 52 inches, two whole outhouse. And I'm, I'm no expert in outhouses, but it's not a hole in the ground, it's a tray. Uh, and that's all I'm gonna say. This is the view from the front door. Not a bad view. Of course, it's uh, uh, still an open field, as you see. Now, 1911, the Zanes were bankrupt, and it was seized by the sheriff. And it was sold to Amos Allabach. And he bought it for the whole property, 75 bucks. This is the advertisement for the property, for the sale. Now, it gives you a little bit of Latin long and the acreage. So, but what's important here, it's a three-story, what they have here is a three-story frame dwelling, 30 by 30, one-story kitchen. And so they add on, even though this was, this was done in 1911, 19, 19, yeah, 1911, the decision to close off the porch was already done. Rooms, first floor rooms, third floor. It's got a cellar porch, three wells, and the tank is on the third floor to provide water to the bathrooms. 12 foot overshoot on the stables for six horses and other outbuildings. So all that sold, 75 bucks. Then in 1815, and Amos sold it to Herman Bear. Now this is the Herman Bear census. It's pretty much, pretty much available to see on itself. Now Herman is on the first page, which he's down here. Okay, so Pennsylvania, he's from Germany. Then the rest of the family is on the next page. So, the wife and then the children. So, in different ages. Nineteen twenty-one, the bear sold it to Fritz Schaubrock. Now, it was believed that 
he was from western Pennsylvania, and he never lived on the property. Then he, Fritz sold it, sold it to Walter Stewart and his wife, Gertrude May, for $8,200. They lived in Warrington at that time on a rented farm, and they came to Hatfield by wagon, two trips, to come to the property. I believe he, he worked for, it's called the Traction Company, which I believe was the traction line, or what we would call today, a streetcar. And he came to Hatfield, and I believe he came to work for Hatfield Township as a highway foreman. I don't have proof that he was hired, but I have his letter of resignation because he went to work for the state in the same capacity. This is showing the transfer of the property to the Stewarts for $8,200. This is the 1924 crop harvest, and they say it's a little hard to read, but it, it, gave, it gave what the Stuarts have as three mares, hold on, excuse me, it gave it hay is 15 acres, there were three males, two females, 15 apple trees, 12 peach trees, two horses, three dairy cattle, 52 pullets, and one automobile. That was what the 24 crop harvest showed that they had. Of course, didn't talk about telephones and obviously no electric. This is the 27 farm census, which I wrote down because the other one was hard to read. And they had, and what you can see here no kitchen running water, so they still had to go outside and get well water. No milking machine, no truck, no tractor, no radio, which is you know, today you find radios in the trash every day, but if they were important enough to be accounted for then, of course you needed electric too. No silo and no electric. What they had was a furnace for heating, an automobile, a gas engine, was the hit and miss engine that did most of the work. It was a popular machine in that area, in that era, for farmers to have this because it could be pulled around to different areas to do work to operate some machinery, like a thrasher or, or whatever, on a farm. And in 27, they had a telephone. 42 acres, five acres of crops, five acres of hay, 40 apple trees, four pear trees, three cows, and 50 hens. This is the Montgomery County Census of 1927. After everybody turned in their census to the state, they compiled it and published a document that by county, by municipality, what the farms were. And here it shows Hatfield Township had 71 farms, and the owners were 66, owned and operated by the owner, 93, and managers and so on and so forth. Next page just shows males, 44 males, 46 females, then the kids, a lot of kids, a lot of hands on the farm. Total acres were 3,029. Acres were par farm per average was 43. So in a total of acreage for crops in Hatfield was 2004. Okay, percent of farmland, we can just read straight across, but at the acres of grain, you can see acres per farm. And you can read it here that shows what they were. Then on the top of the column, you can see wheat, oats, and rye. That's what was farmed here in Hatfield. 346 acres, most of it was oats. Then other, other smaller amount for the, for the rye and wheat. Buckwheat, there again, buckwheat, potatoes and tobacco, not much. Potatoes were grown. Hay and apples, a lot of hay, a lot of apple trees, okay. 
non-varying in different types of where we are with trees, peach trees, pear trees, fair amount. Horses, 136 horses. So if there were 73 farms, that's al almost two horses per farm. So and then the horses of working age. So still, farms were not really mechanized in that time frame. The cows, fair amount of cows. It's like an average of five cows per farm. Another cattle, and you can see it reading across the pigs and chickens. A lot of chickens, 18,000 hens, a lot of chickens. And I guess we can speak to some of them. So you can, in just reading across the column, you can see that it, uh, chickens were a big event in Hatfield Township. Bees, not so many. Running water on a farm, well, you can see none, but 28 farms had water. That's only like one-third. Heating systems, 44, and I would assume they must be room heating systems. But one central heating system might be the Stewart farm because it had, in my, my opinion, steam heat and four milking machines. This is what I think is, is interesting to me. 71 automobiles, so almost every farm had a car. But only one-third of the farms, approximately, had trucks, 29 trucks. And there again, one-third of the farms, tractors, 21 tractors. A fair amount of gas engines, like two-thirds, two-thirds had a hit-and-miss engine to do the work on a farm. And to me, that's interesting, and it gives you a little bit of an insight of what farm life was in Hatfield at that point in time. Phones, maybe two-thirds had a phone. Sixteen farms had a radio. Silos, only eight. Electric, and there again, another interesting. I would assume plant is like a local central electric system. There wasn't any. Stations, I'm really not sure a station unless that was an on-site system. You know, they had sometimes electric, battery electric power, and maybe that's what they meant. But there was no large volume of electric in the farms. And to me, the farms, Hatfield Township was mostly farms, except for probably along the main highway. So you can see a lot of Hatfield Township did not have electric. This was a 1930 census for the property. Of course, down here was Walter Stewart. Walter Stewart, Gertrude May, Walter Jr., Anna May, and Melvin. Melvin is Peg's father, who ultimately ended up with the property. And if you look through here, uh, they're all from Pennsylvania. And you can see where Walter, he worked for the state, and that's ultimately where he retired from, was working on the state. His son worked with him. Melvin was too young to do that. And Gertrude May was a stenographer. So that was what things were like for the Stewarts in 1930. Yeah, Anna May is, Anna May is a stenographer, excuse me. This is an area of view, 1938, of the property. This is, here is Line Lexington Road. The Stewart Farm is right here. And they owned, well, ultimately, they owned the surrounding property. Rita Priest, who lives on Line Lexington up above a bridge, she owned this strip. Crevocious owned this property. And then, ultimately, the Stewart's had this property, which we'll see further on. There again, in 42, you can see the heart, the orchard, which is going to be up here in other pictures, hasn't been started yet. But here's where some of the trees were. The house is here, barn, the machine shed, and 
these were the properties of the Stuarts right here. Kravosha owned this section here, so we, they had to go around the property, and this was the Rita Priest property here. This is a 50 map of the area, which was what the Stuarts owned in that area, but it's going to get larger. Well, what I found to be interesting in here, this is Treby Town Road, which today is Line Lexington, that went through here, and this was Martin Road, or Line Lexington. So I don't think that was changed until 1953. I don't know how the mailman figured it out, maybe. But anyway, that's the way it went. And if the property was never even, square, rectangular, whatever, it was always angle this and angle that. The overhead view, again, 1958. The orchard has started. Properties still have other trees here for fruit bearing trees, hay, and whatnot. And in 58, Melvin bought the property or got the property from his father right here and he built his house in 48. This is Line Lexington Road here. So in 67, when Peg's grandfather passed, Walter, the son Melvin became the owner. There again, you can see not much has changed. The orchard's a little bit better depicted. Still the fields were probably hay fields. Some of the fruit bearing trees didn't survive, but not much else has changed. Line Lexington Road. This is pretty much an outline of the property of the maximum that the Stewarts owned because Melvin and, and Margaret Stewart purchased property surrounding the original farm <clears throat> to be about 78 acres. So what it is then, he, he bought out, this was the Stewart house, Melvin's house, he bought the field next to that. He bought the field at the far end, this was the orchard. He bought the additional field in the back and this field here, which added to the whole property. Okay, and it says 28 acres, make 68 acres, then his three acres. So, and it showed what was here, the grain, grain fields, pasture, remainings of the orchard. So that's pretty much of what things look like in 1971. So in 76, he sold the back acreage for development. And this is an aerial view today, pretty much, of what we have, which this is, there's five fields that make the balance, the remaining of the Stewart farm. Then Stewart Drive and Claremont and Brentwood really is what borders the farm property. And this is pretty much what Melvin, Melvin sold. This over here was the Rita Priest property, and this little strip in here was the Cravosha property. So, so the, it's surrounded. It's surrounded with houses as this shows in the, in, the, in the plot plan view. Hello, I am Peg Stewart Harvey. I am the daughter of Melvin and Margaret Stewart. My father Melvin lived in Hatfield for over 70 years. Dad was born in Philadelphia in 1914, the son of Walter and Gertrude May Stewart. He moved from Warrington at about the age of eight to the Hatfield area in a horse-drawn Buckeye wagon, which cost $80. There's a picture with my dad standing in front of that wagon. The bed of the wagon was layered with straw to hold my grandmother's furniture, and it all survived. 
It was a four-day journey, a travel day, one to a friend's home, stay over, rest themselves and the horses. Then day two, they would finish their journey and then turn around and go back to Warrington, day three and four, back to Hatfield for their final trek. My grandmother never saw the farm until the day she arrived. Turns out that a lot of farms in Warrington were getting struck by lightning, and she told my grandfather, we need to move. Brave woman. So they moved in with three children, no electric, no free running water, and had to start all over again on a new farm. My father was a graduate of Hatfield High School and Philadelphia Trade School for carpentry and welding. He worked in Philadelphia for Turner Construction for 31 years and farmed at the same time. Imagine, he'd worked all day, come home, milk the cows, feed the animals, work on the farm until dark. One thing my dad always did and was faithful to do was he would always feed his animals before he would feed himself, something that Ralph and I have done to this day also. My dad was also a building commissioner in Hatfield Township in the 60s. He was a building inspector for Hatfield Township for eight years and retired in 1979, and he passed away in 1991. My mother, Margaret, Jeanette Sheik Stewart, born 1917, also in Philadelphia, moved to Lansdale at the age of three. She worked in Lansdale textile and interstate hosiery and Glasgow knits, as a designer and supervisor. She did a lot of volunteer work in her lifetime and was a very active member in the community. The farmstead was a working farm, cows, horses, chickens, even a few turkeys, and the farm has been in my family for over 100 years. My dad always seemed to be working on the property. Actually, on his wedding day, he was plowing a neighbor's acreage before heading to the church. My grandmother reheated his tub water three times. My parents married in 1940 and moved right on to the farm, an eye-opener for my mom, because my dad was the country boy marrying the city girl, and it's quite the opposite for Ralph and I. I married the city boy and brought him to the country. Thankfully, he's loved it ever since day one. I've lived on this property my entire life and have had the privilege to walk the fields, ride a horse, and now I roam around on a golf cart. Modern times, right? This farm was a truck farm, a dairy farm, egg farm, and several crops. As a preschooler, I'd ride in front of my grandfather's old green truck to deliver eggs, vegetables, and milk to customers. I was always my dad's sidekick and helper. A vivid adventure was one June day we were planting corn. He was on his Alice Chalmers tractor and me on the back seat of a corn planter. My job, simple. Raise and lower a handle on the corn planter at the end of each row. Then my dad would move to the next row and I would squeeze the handle down and lower it. All was going great until the skies were getting a little darker and a little darker and there was still a half an acre of corn to plant. So he'd speed up. But my dad must have forgotten that I was on the back of the corn planter. He turned the corner, he lined up for the next row, and he gunned it. Mind you, I was on the back of the corn planter, was, and was tossed off. I ran up the adjacent row till I caught up to my dad, and he stopped the tractor, and he said to me, what are you falling off for? I got back on, and we successfully finished planting before the storm hit. Another memory, in 1958, there was a very good old-fashioned blizzard. We had three feet of snow, was down, and Dad had two barns of animals to feed. And as we started out on horseback, we soon realized that it was too much for the horses, and we turned back. Next thing I know, Dad comes out of the barn carrying a rope. And as I watched, he tied the rope around his waist and came back to me and tied the other end around my waist. It literally was snowing sideways that day and blowing. The reason for the rope was in case one of us went down, the other one would know it. You know, I can actually remember what I was wearing that day. We took that trek for three days till we had a path in the field that we could use the horses again. So many memories, milking cows, baling hay, harvesting wheat, oats, gardening. Lots of wonderful memories. I could get on a horse and I could ride for hours and never come out on the road. My parents never had to worry where I was because I was generally on horseback. 
we'd have a picnic, and my dad would take a whole watermelon. He'd put it in a burlap bag and drop it down the farmhouse well. It was cold in no time. My mother learned to can from my grandmother, and she'd work all day and come home to a back porch of tomatoes, peaches, or berries, and she'd work all evening to get things canned. There's still dozens of jars of canned goods in the farmhouse basement. Every August, Mom and I would do corn. I actually have the corn grater that my grandmother used. We'd pick it, we'd husk it, we'd cook it, and we'd freeze it. And such a great taste of summer in the middle of February. One thing we do have, which is absolutely a blessing to me, is my grandfather was a person to journal. And he journaled every day, starting, I think it was in 1914 or 1915, and we have the weather. So he would start his journal out with what the weather was that day and whatever he was doing that day. There are items that still ex exist. There's a sleigh, there's ox, yokes, milk cans, old implements and tools, carbide gas lights, an egg scale, furniture, Dad's Alice Dahmer, Chalmers tractor. There's a lot of memories there, too. Milking cows was a two-times-a-day task for a farmer. I'd help, and once the cows were milked, Dad and I would go up to the farmhouse and we'd strain the milk, and we'd leave two quarts for my grandmother, and we would take the rest home. One time I was walking down the, the long walk, it was almost dark, and I was walking behind my dad, and he'd hidden behind a bush, and he jumped out and he scared me. Yep, you can guess what I happened. I dropped two quarts of milk. To hear my father say, what'd you drop the milk for? He was a trip. There were four chicken coops. One day, my dad asked my mother, as a relatively new bride, would you like to raise a few chickens? She said, sure. And there is actually a receipt for 3,000 chickens. I grew to dislike the coops because one of my jobs and daily chores on the farm was to go gather the eggs. Now, I did not have to con tend with 3,000 chickens, but there were some truly nasty hens who did not like me reaching in under them for their eggs. I got pecked regularly, a reason why Ralph and I never had chickens. Another story that uh, talks about my mother and the chickens is uh, they would put a heater in so the ch chickens would be warm in the winter, and my dad must have told my mother to go and make sure the heater was on, and she turned it on, but she turned it on too high, and she killed a lot of chickens. So my dad went to check on them, and they were several piled up on each other at the door, and they didn't survive. The barn was not off limits to some of the chickens, and there was rumor that friends of mine would come and visit, and we'd pair off, and we'd have egg fights in the hay mow. Lots of fun. The outhouse was another place I visited infrequently. Um, it was dark and dreary and scary to me. And Ralph moved it several years ago because it was in a place where it was getting damp and too much water was around, so we did move it. When we moved it from its original place, we found my grandfather's black wool sweater still hanging on the hook. It's moth-eaten, but we left it there because it's definitely a memory for all to see. Probably a hundred-year-old garment. The farmhouse is still inhabited by two apartments. I can still see my grandfather sitting in the parlor in the corner in his rocking chair. He'd be watching to see if anyone would come up the walk. Interestingly, various apartment dwellers have seen a man with a limp and walking with a cane coming up the front walk. He was also heard going up the back steps. His limp was due to the fact that as a younger man, he contracted yellow fever, which he survived, but it left him with uh, hair loss, and he developed a severe skin condition. He is one reason that I became a nurse, because I used to be his helper, and I would help him clean and dress his legs every day. And I liked helping him, and that pushed me in the direction of nursing. I was introduced to farming as a child. My mom always said she had me by one hand to sit on a piano bench, and my dad had me by the other. And my dad won. I rode from age five, and Ralph and I rode horseback too after we were married. We rode double. Each of us would carry one of our sons until number three son came along, and there was nowhere else to put him, so we stopped riding horses. 
nowhere to put him. I baled hay, and it was my job to push the hay bales away as they came off the conveyor. One time it sped up, and I couldn't keep up. A bale knocked me over, and I was literally underneath it. My dad came to my rescue again, and here's what he said. What are you doing under there? He was a gem. He was my dad, and he was my hero. One of a kind, always honest and upfront, whatever he had to say. All these memories were created because of these buildings. I have taken the time to journal about the farmstead for our children and my grandchildren so they can have an image of the past and know how the Stuart farmstead evolved and existed over the generations. Like my grandparents and my parents, Ralph and I have moved onto the farm, and we did that as a newlywed couple. As time has passed, my husband and myself have felt it is important to maintain the farm, to preserve it for our future generations and keep it in its original state. My parents and grandparents would be so pleased to know that their farmstead is being recognized by the Hatfield Historical Society and the National Registry. Ninety-two, the property has been transferred to Peg and I as our partnership, which we still hold and we still have in in our ownership for, now it's 100 years this year for Stuart to have the property. This is an aerial view, again, of just the property buildings. And obviously the house, this would be the, it's a green roof, would be the wood building. The pump house would be here, garage, milk house, barn, machine shed and outhouse. The big pieces are still, there's still 10 buildings built in 1909 that are still here on the, on the property. As I said before in the beginning, the house has been designated, or the property has been designated a national historic place. And what we'd like to do too, I mean, we're, we're happy to have it and we thank Dave Kimmerly for really making the effort to, to get that done. And it would be nice to have a historic place on preserved ground. Again, it's a summer view, 19, 2019. And again, outhouse, or excuse me, milk house, windmill in the house. And again, the aerial view of the property as it is today, five major fields with the buildings on the property. I'd like to thank Larry for allowing us to present this for everybody to see and hopefully it has an interest in them too. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph and Peg, for presenting this interesting program for us. And thank you to all of you who watched it. I hope that you enjoyed it.